Hello, BookTube. I have a tag for you today on Tag Tuesday. Uh, I wasn't tagged in this, but I did it last year. It's kind of a perennial thing that you can revisit. I hope you all do. It's absolutely fascinating. I've seen a few BookTubers do it. It's the quarter year book tag, where you stop and take stock of what the year is like for you so far, reading wise. Uh, if I remember, I'll leave a link to the video that I did last year so you can compare the two. But uh, but this is just a bunch of questions designed to, to sort of mark where you are in this year. Uh, and question number one, of course, is the most elemental of all. It's how many books have you read so far this year? This has been a very good reading year for me. Not always for the best possible reasons, but I have had a great deal of blocks of time devoted to reading. More so than in any recent year. As of this morning, my number is 375 books. But that number is going to go up before the today changes over to tomorrow. So that number is nice and healthy. It's right about where I want it to be. The number doesn't really matter all that much, uh, of course. Uh, it matters to me, uh, just personally. I would like to read more books this year than I read last year, because no matter how many books I read this year, it's going to be only a tiny fraction of the books that are out there. <laughs> uh, baby. Stop licking, baby. She gets into this zen where she just licks constantly. Frito, stop that. Stop it, baby. Stop licking. <laughs> it's such a cute face. And it's not really harming her. I mean, there are dyes in the in the coloring of a pillowcase that maybe might. It's it's really just that... Anyway, uh, I've had a good active reading year. That's, that's really good for me. Uh, then number two, have you already found a book that you think might be a 2023 favorite? If not, what was your favorite book that you read that wasn't quite five-star? Uh, I don't give book star ratings. I review them instead or talk about them. But I do have some books here that have, that have stood out so far. And this is important to me because I am running a tally, as I do every year. I keep very careful track of the books that I read and what I think about them because at the end of every year I make a list. And the year's best and worst book lists are very common at the end of every year, but uh, there's no other list like mine. <laughs> mine is the best. It is definitive. It is the most entertaining. It will surprise you. And the recommendations on that list will not let you down. Uh, and there's no way to make a list like that in December. You, I, I found, maybe other people could do it, but I found that I have to be keeping notes the whole time. Careful, detailed notes the whole time. So this, is, this stock taking is natural for me. Uh, and I have a list of books here, uh, some of which I think we've already talked about. The Soviet Century by Carl Schlegel, for instance. A uh, big brick of a thing about the the roughly hundred years that the Soviet Union existed and what it left behind, what its footprint is, political, social, even in terms of tchotchkes. I loved the book. Absolutely loved it. Just uh, this one of these sprawling, epic things that is part history, part travel log, part impressionistic memoir. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I've recommended it a few times. Uh, then uh, also a little surprise to me, No Right to an Honest Living by Jacqueline Jones, which is about uh, black people in Boston in the Civil War era when they were technically free. But what was their life like? What, what, what did they, what kinds of avenues of opportunity were open to them? And more importantly, what kinds of avenues of opportunity were explicitly closed to them. Uh, and I admit, when I first heard the description of the book, I thought, well, I know exactly what this is going to be. This is going to be Twitter virtue signaling from beginning to end of the type that has completely captured academia. Uh, but although there were elements of that in the book, I thought it was wonderful, just remarkably good, remarkably unsettling in a really good way. And then in terms of fiction, we can mention, I can mention two things. The Sun Walks Down by Fiona McFarlane, which I think we saw here. Uh, historical novel. They're both the fiction things that I'm mentioning are historical novels. And I'm not 100%. It didn't blow me away. The way I love it when fiction does. When a work of fiction absolutely blows me away. Where there is no doubt in my mind what I'm going to think of it in a year or two years or ten years. This isn't one of those. Neither of these books are. Uh, but I, I still find myself thinking about it. And also The Light at the End of the World by Siddhartha Deb, which is infinitely more ambitious and complex than The Sun Walks Down. Also historical. Many, many different strands of historical novel. I, I found both of them really good 
Whereas I have to admit, in the mainstream publishing world in 2023, a lot of the fiction that I've been reading is really bad. Not, not just average, but this should not have been published in its current form. And I'm, I'm no great fan of the made-up stories, but even so, my judgment of them usually isn't like that. Uh, so I don't know if maybe I'm awarding these two greater points just because they didn't fall flat on their faces and roll down the flight of stairs, but <laughs> well, I'll find out. I'll know at the end of the year. Uh, then number three, question number three is any one star or least favorite books of the year? Uh, and yes, I have, I, I thought up two, there are plenty that I could think up, but, uh, one of them is sticking in my mind is by former Trump official, Mike Pompeo, who did a book that the more I think about it, and I think about it more than I want to, the more it angers me. Um, cause he can't claim to be a Rudy Giuliani nut job the way so many Trump satellite creatures can be. He isn't that. So he's therefore much, much worse than they are. Uh, but I, I only came up with two. In fiction, it was Rebecca, Rebecca Mackay's book, I Have Some Questions for You, which I thought was incomprehensibly bad. Just, just if you handed it in for a, a freshman in high school composition class to any halfway competent teacher, it would come back covered in red commentary, just covered in it, with maybe a comment saying, I, I'm not going to give this even a provisional grade. What I want is for you to redo it before I will even provisionally grade it. I'm not giving anyone else a second chance to rewrite their whole project, but uh, trust me, you don't want the grade that I would give this, this thing the way it is now. I would like you to rethink it completely. And my office door is open if you want to discuss how to do that. An emergency intervention is what this would have been gotten in the freshman high school composition class. But here it is being lauded in the press. <laughs> That's fiction. And then for nonfiction, I know it's a trite, uh, pick here, but it has been bothering me more than any other book I have read this year, and that is Spare by Prince Harry. His vicious, acidic, completely fictional, bridge-burning, clout-chasing memoir about how horrible it is to grow up as a prince of the realm, and how everyone did him wrong. Uh, it's not just that I firmly believe there's not a word of truth anywhere in this book. It's not just that, because I was expecting that. Prince Harry has been completely captured by Twitter politics, by the Twitter mind frame, by the progressive stack. In other words, by the religion of his wife. So, And I, because he's been completely captured by that, and this book was basically written by her, I assumed that that's what this would be like. But it wasn't just that. I, the, the reason why it's sticking with me in such a negative way is how mean it is to people who've n almost never done this guy any wrong. Just in every direction, just mean in every direction, even to the dead. It's just, it's it's definitely up there. Uh, uh, let's see here. Question number four is the most read genre so far. That would be fiction, as it is every year. Fiction. Uh, book number five is a book that surprised you. Uh, it's I don't know if we saw it on this channel or not. It's Harvard Square, A Love Story by Catherine Turco, which I thought was going to be a kind of uh, episodic potted histories of Harvard Square, which is an area of Cambridge across the river from Boston uh, that is hard to describe unless you've experienced it, and even harder to describe if you've never experienced it in any of its heydays. It is not in a heyday now. <laughs> I think that would be fair to say, even though that goes against the spirit of this book. It's not in a heyday now. It's a Bank of America corporate Viacom billboard Times Square type thing now. But for a long, long time, it wasn't. For a long, long time, it was a weird gathering place at the heart of a, a vibrant city that is 100% dependent on a vibrant university. And all the seeking and the unfinished qualities of all the undergraduate students and all their different decades and preoccupations all the infusion of outside students and outside professors and talent and intellectual currents. I remember Harvard Square in a lot of the incarnations that are that are glowingly depicted in this book. And I was expecting no more than a series of those depictions. But it's I wasn't expecting how loving the book is, despite love being in the subtitle. I wasn't expecting it to be so heartfelt, so moving. Uh, so it could easily find its way onto that list of 
favorite books of the year. With time, it could easily do that. Uh, then question number six is a uh, books book that comes out in 2023 already that you want to read but haven't read yet. And I would love to go at this question really smug and say oh, I got to them all, but uh, I haven't got to them all. There are plenty that I'm holding over, and a couple of them. In fact, the three that I listed here, I'm, I'm I haven't read yet. Not because I don't have them, but because I kind of know what they're going to do to me. I kind of know what kind of reading experience they're going to be, and I'm not sure that I want it. Uh, one is James Rosen's biography of Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, uh, who has become uh, you know, an ur-conservative dude-bro saint in heaven. And I don't know James Rosen. I have no idea whether or not he views Scalia that way, but I, I, it's, a, it's a hefty book, and I... I've been putting off reading it because I've been worried that it's going in, that we're going into the book assuming that this is the greatest justice who's ever sat on the high court. Uh, when actually, as a justice, he was fairly monstrous. So I, I don't, I don't, I will do it. I obviously can't let it go. And an, another one is by Matthew Dalek, and it's called Birchers. It's about the John Birch Society, which those of you who were born in the 20th century will not have any idea what that is. But it was the, the fertile seed ground for something that you definitely do know uh, in the United States, in the United States of the 21st century, we have two political parties. And one has its head up its posterior and likes to spend money that it can't back up and has a whole bunch of virtue signaling and annoying qualities that I hate. And the other one is openly, violently fascistic. The other one, the, the losing party, the minority party, the party that can't win without voter suppression and redistricting, uh, doesn't want there to be an America anymore. It's just common now for the modern day 21st century Republicans to get in front of the few cameras that will still have them and say things that just routinely in the course of a conversation say things that would have completely ended any public career that they would ever have a chance of having even dog catcher if they'd said it even 50 years ago, if they said it when the John Birch Society was in its heyday. These sorts of things are just routinely said now. They're routinely believed. And no one cares at all. And they don't care because, as is, as is true with most permanently minority millenarian parties, most of the foremost spokespeople of the 21st century Republican Party are looking forward to, they're looking to a day when there is no more accountability. They aren't looking for a day when they are elected into office. They're looking for a day when the system burns down and they are no longer accountable for any of the stuff that they say or do now. A before and after, a fire break, which is millenarian thinking. That is end of the world thinking. That is, you know, uh, that is literally the only thing that exists in the world is me. And if I have to destroy this system in order to keep making my bennies, then I will. Uh, and that, that strand of if if you don't like my vision for this country, get the hell out. Or if you don't like this vision for my country, my friends and I are going to kill you. It is something that the John Birch Society would have recoiled against too, but they were laying the groundwork for it. And some of us at the time kind of sort of thought that. Only it was such a fringe thing that no one in a million years thought that a president would get elected espousing that kind of of hateful ideology. No one expected that, we, that the John Birch Society would ever give birth to ideological progeny so powerful that you could live through a time when a president of the United States says, well, if you believe in the wrong God, you're not welcome in this country. I'm going to impose a, a Muslim travel ban <laughs> so, or any of the million other things like that that have now become just completely normalized, just completely normalized. You pi plant pipe bombs at the Capitol on the eve before a violent insurrection to which you were giving out detailed floor plans to violent insurrectionists. You ask for a presidential pardon because you know you've committed high treason on several counts, and you get a fawning interview on 60 Minutes. That, <laughs> uh, see, you see, you can see what I'm talking about, that, that this book, Birch's, is going to work me out. Probably not in any ways that it intends, but I can't just leave it unread. The minute I start to do that, I'm, I'm, I'm drifting into the camp of these, you know, posing, look at me idiots who bray all day long about what kind of trigger warnings they need. I will read them. I just, I know already that they're not going to make my day, so I've been putting it off. And the same thing with the third one for a different reason, uh, which is Rebecca Heisman's book, Flight Paths, which is about, it, it's a series of profiles about 
profiles about and also details about uh, bird migration and the people who figured out how that works. And it's a massively complicated and unbelievably interesting subject. Not so much why birds migrate, although even that is interesting on its own. Some bird, some bird heads migrate for the first time, but also how they do it, how they do it, the, the timing, the navigation, the endurance, some, some stories of bird migration are unbelievable. In, in their details. They happen year after year, every year. It's not so much that, that that will bring me down when reading the book. It's the fate of these migratory birds, which has got to be an element of this book. And it's, it's, it's very gloomy. Uh, but those are three. Uh, those are three books, anyway, that I still have to get to, even though they're already out. There are plenty of others. This question doesn't, this, this tag doesn't ask for books that are forthcoming for the year. I think that's later. Uh, the mid-year freakout tag or something like that. Um, so these are just ones that are out. And there are others, but most of them are genre stuff that I know I will get to. Uh, then question number seven is one goal you made that you're succeeding at. And question number eight is one goal you made that you need to focus on. Uh, in other words, that you're not succeeding at. Uh, and for me, they are the same thing. Not only the answer to both questions is the same, but they're the same as I believe the question, the answers that I gave last year, which is indie publishing the surging world of indie publishing. More and more books indie published every year than have ever been published in the history of the world. And not all of them bad. The quality level has been going up at, with the rising tide, as you would expect. There are professional editing services, professional proofreading services, professional formatting services. Indie books are no longer the you know vanity press waste of time that they were even 25 years ago. Now they're a vibrant world on their own. And I read a lot of indie books. A lot of the books that I've read so far this year have been indie titles. But I could stand to read a lot more. So I am fulfilling that goal in that I am reading more indie books than I once did. But the goal could still be improved. I could still be doing more of that. And not only reading more of it, but giving them more attention. Reviewing more of them. Maybe putting out feelers to have authors on to talk about more of them. I haven't done that. I didn't do that at all in the year in between the last time I did this tag and now, and I should. Uh, I just, I just, <laughs> there's already so much to talk to you about in videos. I, I don't, it doesn't occur to me to have authors on. And plus, I, I have to wonder how many of them would agree to do it, right? I mean, there are indie authors on BookTube who have new books who or forthcoming books who kind of don't want anything to do with me, who assume that I'm Satan incarnate, or they, they may not have any negative opinions about me myself, but they're courting the opinions of people who do. All that kind of, you know, baked in idiocy or cowardice that play, comes into play. Maybe if I, if I would just make a rule that, you know, no booktube books, maybe I'll just make that rule and then and a normal indie published author is not going to know, I don't think, anything about that or care one way or another. Uh, but that I really do need to do that. I need to get better at that. I, I done, I'm doing more. I do more, more this year, even now, than I did last year. But I could still stand to improve. Uh, and then uh, question number nine, the last question is, new to you booktubers slash bookstagrammers slash book talkers for 2023 that you can recommend? I want to recommend a handful of people here. First, Randy Ray. Uh, who joined us, joins us, he started a booktube channel of his own over at Driftwood Ranch. Uh, I'll leave a link to all of these down below. His channel is wonderful, chatty, wide, wide open to the kinds of things that he's reading. That's the kind of reader that I like. Also, uh, my compadre, Jack Strange, uh, I'll leave a link to his channel as well. He, I, I noticed his channel uh, because of a wonderful video that he did reviewing and gushing over uh, Paris Hilton's new memoir. I hadn't, I had the book, but I hadn't read it at the time. And I saw that, I saw his video and thought, well, okay, <laughs> you're doing this really smart and really clever, really heartfelt. He's not trying to fool you at all with where his, you know, enthusiasms lie. I, I was watching his video. I, I almost said out loud, well, I'm going to have to read the thing now. And I ended up not agreeing with him about the book, but it doesn't matter. I was sold over, I was sold on his channel anyway, by that point. And also, uh, Isabel reads and writes. Who did a video uh, introducing herself to AuthorTube? Bless her. <laughs> I don't. I asked the other day on a Steve stream, whatever happened to AuthorTube? Is it still a thing, or is it totally by my academic planner grifters? Is it is it only people selling a ten day seminar, a webinar about writing, or whatnot? Is it only people who uh, 
are only making so-called authortube videos in order to virtue signal that they only like the right people and hate all the wrong people, that they are on the right side of history, all that sort of vaguely curly toned, condescending, school marm stuff that the more I see it, the more I hate it, and I, a lot of author two videos that I've watched are like that. I, I, or done by people who have indie published or traditional published and are proud of how cynical they are. Yeah, I don't, I don't care about any of this. Here's, here's the things you have to do, kids. Here are the babies you have to sacrifice. Here are the relatives you have to have nothing to do with anymore. You know, it's, you gotta do that in order to make it in this biz. I've watched a lot of authortube videos that just, for one reason or another, didn't please me at all. And so I stopped watching, and, I, and that led me to wonder, does it still exist? <laughs> I should get back, get back into it, get more involved. I'm sure there are channels out there that I would like, and Isabel Reads and Rice is one of them. Uh, and then, finally, the last, last channel that I will shout out here is uh, Chatting Category Romances, which is a new channel. It's it's new to me. It's legitimate for an answer to this question, even though I'm one of the people making that channel. Sarah at the Bookish Knitter and I have started a second channel devoted to category romances. Uh, it uh, we we she made the channel and we made announcement videos yesterday, and I was kind of hoping. I mean, I realized I recognized that category romances are a niche interest within a niche interest. Romance is already a niche interest on booktube anyway. I mean, it's the best-selling genre in the world, but it's still a niche interest on booktube. It's still condescended to on booktube. And even within romance, the category romances are something completely different that are often condescended to even by romance readers. So I knew that it was a niche within a niche, and I wasn't expecting much. I was kind of hoping that by the end of the year, chatting category romances would have 50 subscribers. That would be a nice round number. It'd be an, it, would, it would be... It, 50 subscribers would be sh would ensure for both Sarah and myself, that we're not just talking to ourselves, which wouldn't be a deal breaker. <laughs> we both do love to talk, but uh, but she informs me that we are closing in on 200 subscribers for chatting category without a single video on the channel yet. <laughs> There's no content on the channel yet. So that is wonderful. I'm I'm looking forward to having a great deal of fun on that channel. Uh, so I'll leave, I'll leave a link to it and to everything else here, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. That was the uh, the quarter year book tag. Tremendous fun to take stock here, and the one of only two times that I will do this, the mid-year freakout tag I will also do. But a, after the mid-year freakout tag, if I do that, after that, there'll be no more uh, submarine pinging about the shape of my annual read of the year until I do my list at the end of the year. So this was, this was a very good chance for me to sort of take stock of where I am. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, and I will be back. Thank you, book two.